Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Mindy Mandel, and I am here with Jacob and with Jed. And together, we're going to be reading Plato's Republic. Um, so we, this is the very first day, so we're going to be going through the introduction. And let me jump to the text now. And so we are using the Joet translation. These days it is very hard to find free translations. I'd like to be able to put a link in the description box for those of you who don't have the text. Um, but it is, um, the laws are changing in, um, in America. Um, for those of you who are overseas, you may not know this, but there have been some lawsuits um, with putting free books online, some of the publishers don't like that very much, which is understandable, and so there are some legal battles going on. Um, but this is a translation that is off the Internet Archive, and um, um, those of you who find it helpful to use the Internet Archive, um, you might want to think of you know, making a donation to them if you can afford to do so. I have no connection to them, but I use them a lot, and I'm very grateful to them. And So I'll just throw that out there. Um, but this is the Joet translation. Um, to be honest, I've never read the Joet translation before. I've used the lobe. I have the lobe here, and we may switch to it. I did find a lobe, but it's missing much of book one. And... And then of the part that is remaining, there's a lot of writing on the page. I couldn't find a free one with a clean copy. There are some that you can rent, like you can take out like a library book. So you have it just a, a short amount of time. But as far as free download, the only copy I could find of the lobe is not a very clean copy. But anyway, we'll use this one at least for book one and then decide together if we like this translation or not. Um, but I did go through book one um, in this translation, and it seems it's enough to work with. Um, so one thing I want to point out here is the title underneath. Joe, it is different here than some other translations that I've seen. Most just say that it is on justice. This is the only translation I've seen where it's, where it's on wealth, justice, moderation, and their opposites. And I think moderation is his translation of temperance. Okay, so looking at the virtues. And it is, and wealth is not a, a one of the four virtues, but um, justice and temperance both are. And so he's recognizing this anyway as a dialogue on the virtues. Um, so it opens up, this one here, it's, one of the, it's rare that Socrates is the narrator. But this is one of the few dialogues in which he is. And that allows us to get into his head a little bit, which is kind of nice. Okay, but we see here it opens with the scene is laid in the house of Cephalus at the Piraeus. The Piraeus, as I understand, is like a port area outside of Athens. And the whole dialogue is narrated by Socrates the day after it actually took place in the Timaeus, in the dialogue Timaeus. That's what the reference here is is he's talking about, there's, it opens with some idea that he had been talking about something like this. It's either this exact dialogue, or he had this sort of conversation with someone else. So it's generally considered to be like the Timaeus takes place the day after this very long conversation. Okay, now there's quite a bit in the introduction here. Um, but there's much that you won't really see until after you go through the rest of the dialogue. So it might be fun after, and it's going to take us quite a while, obviously, to get through. This is a very long dialogue, one of the longest. I think the laws is the longest, but this is the second longest. But at the end, to come back and look at the introduction again and see even more. But we can at least pull out some things this first time through. So since there's mostly narration here, um, I'll start the reading. Okay, so it starts off, I went down yesterday to the Piraeus with Glaucon, the son of Ariston, that I might offer up my prayers to the goddess. Um, just as a side note here, Glaucon, it mentions here as son of Ariston. What, he, what Plato did not tell you is that Plato is also the son of Ariston. 
and Glaucon is his brother. So this is, so Socrates is with Plato's brother, Glaucon. And they want to offer up their prayers to the goddess. And you can see in the footnote here that the goddess is Bendis, or the um, Bendis in the um, Athenian system is called Artemis. Okay, so they went down to see, um, to pray to this goddess, and they wanted to see what manner they would celebrate the festival. So there's some sort of festival to Artemis. Um, they want to see what manner they would celebrate the festival, which was a new thing. I was delighted with the procession of the inhabitants, but that of the Thracians was equally, if not more, beautiful. In the Loeb translation, it says they're equally beautiful, and it, in the Rouse translation as well, and I think actually Thomas Taylor as well. So he may be the only one who says um, equally, if not more. When we had finished our prayers and viewed the spectacle, we turned in the direction of the city, meaning they're heading back to Athens. By the way, the footnote in the Loeb says that it's about a five-mile walk between Athens and the Piraeus. So a very long walk. Um, so they turned in the direction of the city, and at that instant, Polemarchus, the son of Cephalus, chanced to catch sight of us from a distance as we were starting on our way home and told his servant to run and bid us wait for him. The servant took hold of me by the cloak from behind and said, Polemarchus desires you to wait. Okay, so what we see here so far, what is Socrates doing? What did he come to town for? Okay, Jacob, what did he come to town for? The festival? Mm. Or the yeah, and what does he want to do at this festival? Two things. To see what manner they celebrate the festival? Hmm. And view it? Mm, no. Prayers. Prayers to the goddess. Prayers to Artemis. Good. Yes. So two things, his prayers, and then also he's going to judge the festival. How does it compare to the Thracian festival? Okay, so two things. And so we want to keep that in mind. It is something significant, but we can't really see it at this point. Okay, so he's about to leave, and then this um, servant boy um, pulls on his cloak and says that Polemarchus desires you to wait. Um, maybe I can get someone to read with me. So who wants to read for the servant boy? Okay. okay. So I turned around and asked him where his master was. There he is, coming after you, if you will only wait. And I need a Glaucon. Certainly. Uh, you're, you you're my friend. And in a few minutes, oh, wait. oh, yeah, I'm sorry. And in a few minutes, Polemarchus appeared. And with him was Adimantus, Glaucon's brother, which means he's also Plato's brother, of course. Um, Nicaratus, the son of Nicias, and several others who had been at the procession. And now the servant boy doesn't talk anymore, so <laughs> maybe you can be Polemarchus, Jacob. I perceive, Socrates, that you and your companion are already on your way to the city. You are not far wrong. But do you see how many we are? Of course. And are you stronger than all these? For if not, you will have to remain where you are. May there not be an alternative that we may persuade you to let us go? But can you persuade us if we refuse to listen to you? Glaucon. Certainly not. Then we are not going to listen. Of that you may be assured. And then Edimontus added, Has no one told you of the torch race on horseback 
in honor of the goddess, which will take place in the evening? And then Socrates replies, oh, with horses, that is a novelty. Will horsemen carry torches and pass them one to another during the race? Yes, and not only so, but a festival will be celebrated at night, which you certainly ought to see. Let us rise soon after supper and see this festival. There will be a gathering of young men, and we will have a good talk. Stay then, and do not be perverse. I suppose, since you insist, that we must... And in this translation, Socrates says, very good. But I checked a few others, and because certainly in the, in the lobe it's different, and I checked a few others, and it seems they all have an if, which I think is significant. If you think so, Glaucon, then so it will be. Something to that effect. And we want to see what, the, what difference does that make. In fact, let's start there. So Glaucon says that I suppose since you insist, we must. Now, if Socrates' reply is very good, what does that imply? How does he feel compared to Glaucon? Is he in full agreement? Is he wavering? Seems According to, to this full translation, mm, full agreement. Yeah, yeah, very good. Let's do that. Yeah. How does it change if the translation is, well, if you think so, Glaucon, then so it will be, then so be it. Yeah, then he seems to be, you know, echoing what Glaucon says. That's like, if, if you say so, mm -hmm. you know. All right, so in that case, is he going for Polemarchus or for Glaucon? Glaucon? Mm. And not for himself either. I should have thrown that one in there. Yeah, so it's only because Glaucon says that he thinks we must. Now let's go back a little bit here. Back up here, when Polemarchus first spoke to Socrates at the top of page two. Oh yeah, one thing that I, it is a problem with this Joet is there are no Stephanus numbers. Um, I will give Stephanus numbers from time to time as we go. Right now we're early enough that we can just, it's the second page. But as we're further in, I will give Stephanus numbers from time to time. And certainly on the thumbnails, I'll include the Stephanus numbers for the sections that we cover. Um, but here at the top of page two, where Paul and Marcus try to picture it like a movie. I think that's really helpful with a lot of these dialogues to try to picture it to see the dynamic a little bit better how it's playing out so Polo Marcus says that oh Socrates I see that you and your companion are on your way to the city you've already turned around and Socrates says you are not far wrong now at this point the next response might you would might imagine it would be well why don't you come back to my place you got a long walk you know you can rest a bit we'll talk have some supper go to the night show but instead, he says, but do you see how many we are? What do you think of that response? What does that tell you about the dynamic here? If you're trying to picture, what is Socrates doing when he says you're not far wrong? What do you imagine his body language to be? Jed, any thoughts? Polemarchus said to me, I perceive, Socrates, that you and your companion are already on your way to the city. All right, I'm with you, yeah. Um, All right. You not You're not far wrong. And then, the uh, and then instead of an invitation, he gets this, but do you see how many we are? As if it's a threat. <laughs> right. Hmm. Right. So his vague response of Socrates it seems like he's a little bit defensive and quite rightly so because the follow-up by Polymarchus is a mm. kind of a threat like he want mm. he's threatening um, him we, we outnumber mm. you buddy mm. yeah now unfortunately when we're reading the text we lose some of the, we lose the intonation 
We lose the body language. We lose all of that. I can imagine Socrates' line being said in a friendly way. You would stop. You're, he's waiting for Polemarchus, and he says, oh, yeah, you're not far wrong. We were on our way back. It could be, um, if he's fully stopped and he says it in a friendly tone, it does not sound like a brush off. But you can also imagine him kind of turning away and like, yeah, you're not far wrong. We're gone. <laughs> and it seems to come across that way, I would suggest, because of the next line. If he said it, if Socrates seemed open to talking to Polemarchus, then I would expect Polemarchus, and if they were friends, then I would expect Polemarchus's next line to be, well, why don't you come back to our place for a little bit? We'll have a chat before you head back. Got a five-mile walk. Instead, we get this threat. But do you see how many we are? And of course, and then he asks, are you stronger than all these? For if not, you have to remain. What does that mean? What are the choices he's giving Socrates? Yeah, overpower us. Um, mm. uh, for if not, you will have to remain where you are. If you're not stronger than all of us combined, mm. You have to stay here and not go back to where you're going. Mm, right. So it sounds like physically forcing you to stay. Right. Yeah, it's a threat. Is this just? Mm, is this justice? No, it's not justice. In the mm. in the uh, Greek, I think it's you have to become more uh, greater in number. Uh, self has to be greater uh, than us in number. Um, which is an interesting way of saying it, but. Mm. Mm. So now this is a dialogue on justice. And in this opening scene, we see an act of injustice. They're kidnapping Socrates. And his response is some form of, well, okay, I guess we'll go. So the whole thing is a failure. Right in the very beginning, we see Socrates giving in to an injustice. So would you agree that this whole dialogue just failed? Plato is not showing us justice? Not yet. Not yet. Mm -hmm. And especially if we consider that the Greek is something closer to, if Glaucon, you think we should go, so be it. So Socrates is only giving in to the injustice for Glaucon. Now, by the way, Adimantus here tried to lighten things up a little bit. And he is one of the um, more reasonable, we'll find, Adimantus and Glaucon are the two interlocutors through most of the dialogue. And they're the ones who are more open to Socrates' um, philosophical ideas. And so he talks about this torch race on horseback. And they talk about sup, and then um, Polemarchus comes back in, talking about supper and seeing the festival later. So we got to look to see if that ever even happens. He promises kind of like a date. We'll have the dinner and some entertainment. So we got to see if that even happens. So he made him that promise. He didn't open with that promise. He opened with the threat. And then he made it seem more friendly. Okay, so that's the scene. That's the opening scene. It seems like Socrates doesn't really want to go, but he's going for Glaucon. And so we want to look for why, what is the justice in going for Glaucon, since this is a dialogue on justice, and we're not ready to give up just yet, as uh, Jacob said. Okay, so he goes on to say that, Accordingly, we went with Polemarchus to his house, and there we found his brothers, Lysias and Euthydemus, and with them... Thrasymachus the Caledonian, Charmantides the Paean, and Cletophon the son of Aristonymus. There too was Cephalus, the father of Polemarchus, whom I had not seen for a long time, and I thought him very much aged. 
He was seated on a cushioned chair and had a garland on his head, for he had been sacrificing in the court. And there were some other chairs in the room, arranged in a semicircle, upon which we sat down by him. I'm going to pause there for a moment, because again, we're setting the scene, and we want to make sure we can see it clearly in our minds. So there's all these people there, and we see that the patriarch of the family, Cephalus, has garland around his head. He's been in the sacrif- he's been making sacrifices. We'll find out later in the introduction the significance of that. But early on here, at this point here, did it seem rather spontaneous? Um, this greeting between or this meeting between Socrates and Polemarchus. Did it seem spontaneous? No, it seemed like he had a plan to mm. bring Socrates or someone back. Mm. Mm. Okay, so um, this at that instant, we turned in the direction of the city, and at that instant, Polemarchus, the son of Cephalus, chanced to catch sight of us from a distance. So it is, it is possible it was a setup. But it's also possible that they just happen to bump into each other. So you might have that question, but as we get here, it's very clear. What's, this, what's the situation here? They are preparing some kind of ceremony or some, you know, mm. uh, having some kind of gathering, you know, mm. to, that the chairs are arranged in a semicircle mm. and you know, uh, Cephalus is waiting or mm. sitting there f- for them. Exactly. So it's a setup, right? They, they managed to find Socrates and they brought him back. And so now we want to see what is the reason they wanted Socrates there. Um, so I'll go on and read Socrates. If someone will read Cephalus. Yeah. Um, sure. Okay. So Cephalus saluted me eagerly, and then he said, You don't come to see me, Socrates, as often as you ought. If I were still able to go and see you, I would not ask you to come to me. But at my age, I can hardly get to the city, and therefore you should come oftener to the Piraeus. For let me tell you that the more the pleasures of the body fade away, the greater to me are the pleasure and charm of conversation. Do not then deny my request, but make our house your resort, and keep company with these young men. We are old friends, and you will be quite at home with us. Okay, let me pause there for a moment to take a look at this, because one of the themes that you're going to see running through this dialogue is appearance versus reality, where things look one way on the surface, but if you're really listening carefully, as someone like Socrates probably is, you're going to recognize the reality as something different. On the surface... What would you? What is your impression of this greeting by Cephalus? Seems nice enough. You know, hmm. he he misses Socrates essentially. He's like, hmm. you know, I miss our, our conversations. Hmm. And does it seem like he wants to have conversation with Socrates? Sure, it does. Hmm. Yeah, he he set all this up, right? But let's take another look at what he really is saying here. Um, This line here, I think, is probably not a great translation. At my age, I can hardly get to the city. The word hardly does give it a little bit of ambiguity, right? It's difficult. I can... um, When you can hardly do something, it means rarely. Um, In other translations, it's something more to the effect of, I cannot get to the city easily. How would that change the statement? Can he get to the city? Yes. Mm. 
he can get there. It's just hard work. It just tr- it's troublesome. So he's not telling Socrates that I'm unable to talk with you. If it was important to him, he would go. What he's saying is, it's too much trouble. I'll only talk to you if it's easy, like if I can get my son to kidnap you when you're in town here. And then what is he saying here? The more the pleasures of the body fade, the greater for me are the pleasure and charm of conversation. See if I can highlight this. This highlighter is kind of funky. All right. He's kind of like falling back on conversation. Mm-hmm. He's like, it's it's mm-hmm. not it's not what was important to me, but now that it's all that I have available, like mm-hmm. then now it's good. Mm-hmm. Good, yeah. And Jed, is he saying that now he loves conversation? Uh, no, he's uh, satisfied. Mm-hmm. He satisfied the bodily pleasures and uh, for that period in which um, those urges or desires Mm. are no longer Mm. active, he is, he sees that there's a, he has an interest in conversation only in that Mm. refractory Mm. period. Right. And there's like a comparison there. The more the pleasures fade, the greater do I enjoy conversation. So there's something comparative there. The pleasures are of the body are more important. And they maybe they haven't faded all the way, so the joy of conversation is not quite there yet either. No, they're still very much there, yeah. Mm, right, yeah. So he's still drawn to the pleasures of the body. And then look who he wants to talk to. What does he want Socrates to do? Does he want Socrates to talk to him? Did he, did he capture Socrates, kidnap him because he wants to talk to Socrates? No, he, he just says, keep company with these young men. Mm. Yeah, and you'll be at home with us. Talk to them. You talk to them. I don't want to talk to them. I'm not a philosopher who can talk to them. I want you to do it. And I don't want to talk to you, Socrates. I'm going to go make sacrifices because that's my idea of being spiritual. You talk to them. Well, Socrates is not one to be fooled by this sort of uh, presentation. So his reply is, There's nothing which for my part I like better, Cephalus, than conversing with aged men. Is he accepting the invitation to talk to the young boys, the young men? No. He's like, you're going to kidnap me? I'm going to talk to you. (laughs) And he says, I regard aged men as travelers who have gone a journey which I too may have to go, and of whom I ought to inquire whether the way is smooth and easy or rugged and difficult. And this is a question which I should like to ask of you, who have arrived at that time which the poets call the threshold of old age. Is life harder toward the end? Or what report do you give of it? I will tell you, Socrates, what my own feeling is. Men of my age flock together. We are birds of a feather, as the old proverb says. And at our meetings, the tale of my acquaintance commonly is, I cannot eat, I cannot drink, the pleasures of youth and love are fled away. There was a good time once, but now that is gone, and life is no longer life. Some complain of the slights which are put upon them by relations, and they will tell you sadly of how many evils their old age is the cause. But to me, Socrates, these complainers seem to blame that which is not really in fault. For if old age were the cause, I too, being old, and every other old man, would have felt as they do. But this is not my own experience, nor that of others whom I have known. How well I remember the aged poet Sophocles, when, in answer to the question, How does love suit with age? Sophocles. 
Are you still the man you were? Peace, he replied. Most gladly have I escaped the thing of which you speak. I feel as if I had escaped from a mad and furious master. His words have often occurred to my mind since, and they seem as good to me now as at the time when he uttered them. For certainly old age has a great sense of calm and freedom. When the passions relax their hold then, as Sophocles says, we are freed from the grasp not of one mad master only, but of many. The truth is, Socrates, that these regrets and also the complaints about relations are to be attributed to the same cause, which is not old age, but men's characters and tempers. For he who is of a calm and happy nature will hardly feel the pressure of age, but to him who is of an opposite disposition, youth and age are equally a, bur a burden. Good, thank you. So let's go back and see how well, <clears throat> excuse me, how well did um, Cephalus understand what Sophocles had said. So this is at the bottom of page three. So Sophrity, Sophocles was asked if he's still the man he was. And he replied, Peace, most gladly have I escaped the thing of which you speak. I feel as if I had escaped from a mad and furious master. So he's not stating specifically what it, what it is he's referring to that he escaped from, right? <laughs> Let's keep that in mind for a moment as we look at the way Cephalus interpreted that statement. He said, when the passions relax their hold. So what is he then interpreting Sophocles to be talking about? The passions as that uh, mm. mad and furious master. Mm. Mm. Good. Yeah, so he's talking about passions, plural, right? How about in Sophocles' statement? Is it plural? It's not. It's not. The thing. So whatever that thing is, it's not the passions, plural. And he says they relax their hold. What does it mean to relax their hold? Is it the same as escaped? Sophocles used the word escape. What does escape mean? To be completely free of it. Mm. Not to still be in the clutches of it, but just right. lessened. Yeah. Is that the same as relax their hold? I don't think so. No. Yeah, this statement of, of Cephalus seems to go back to what we saw up here. The more the pleasure of the bodies fade away, the greater are the pleasures of the charm and charm of conversation. Right? There's that relationship. They're comparative. They're relaxing their hold. And when they relax their hold, we're freed from the grasp of the many, many pleasures. All right, so not the same. So there we're seeing, so the role of interpretation plays a powerful, is a powerful theme throughout this dialogue. And so we're seeing it here, that he's not seeing, he's not looking clearly at what Sophocles actually said. He's looking at his own feelings and sort of projecting it onto Sophocles. So we're not sure who this mad and furious master really is, but it's not the passions, not for Sophocles. But that's the way that um, Cephalus takes it. And so he says that um, he contributes, what does he contribute? His, his ability, so he's talking here, let me go back up a little, that some of his friends, they complain a lot. They complain that they can't really enjoy life anymore. But he says he can, and this is sort of bringing us now to the top of page four, 
Jed, what does he contribute his ability to handle old age well? Uh, his character? Hmm. Good. Yes. Men's character and tempers. Right. So he's actually not expressing here a philosophical state of mind as, as Socrates understands that to be. Um, he's saying that he's still, it's very clear from the things that we've seen him say up to this point, that the pleasures of the body are still more um, engrossing to him, more en engrossing of his attention than things like having conversation. Yeah, talk to the young men, don't talk to me. And it's clear that he only wants conversation to the degree that he can't do something more fun. But yet he's saying that it's his character and his temper that allows him to enjoy old age. Well, Socrates listened to this. And he says, I listened in admiration. And wanting to draw him out that he might go on. So Socrates is going to poke the bear a little here, right? See what he can get out of him. He says to him, yes, Cephalus. But I rather suspect that people in general are not convinced by you when you speak thus. They think that old age sits lightly upon you, not because of your happy disposition, but because you're rich. And wealth is well known to be a great comforter. You are right. They are not convinced. And there is something in what they say. Not, however, so much as they imagine. I might answer them as Themistocles answered the Seraphim who was abusing him and saying that he was famous, not for his own merits, but because he was an Athenian. Quote, if you had been a native of my country or I of yours, neither of us would have been famous. End quote. And to those who are not rich and are impatient of old age, the same reply may be made. For to the good, poor man, old age cannot be a light burden, nor can a bad, rich man ever have peace with himself. Now, what did he just say? So, Seriphus was some small island. I understand. So the basic idea here of um, the, the Seriphian was abusing Themistocles, saying that the only reason you've made a name for yourself is because you're from Athens. What does Themistocles' response mean? If you'd been a native of my country or I of yours, neither of us would have been famous. What does that mean? I don't know. But the, uh, <laughs> that, you know, him saying that the good poor man mm. cannot, you know, have old age, you know, lightly, mm. um, but that also a bad rich man can't have peace. Maybe he's saying something like, uh, be, you know, that he's good and that, you know, because he's rich and good, that's why he has it. Has, has it nicely. Right. Yeah. So at the top part here, he did agree a little bit with Socrates. He didn't say Socrates was completely wrong. He says there is something in what they say. So the money does matter to him. It does make him more comfortable, and it does make old age easier for him. And he then he says here that the good poor man, even if you're good, old age is still going to be a little bit rough because you're poor. So he's acknowledging that, or that he feels that way. But then, yeah, as um, Jacob was saying there, that he's, a, he's both good and rich, and that's why he's comfortable. And so he's making an analogy between that idea and this one. So 
So they're talking about fame as opposed to the comforts of or handling old age well. And then, whereas he's rich, Themistocles is Athenian, so from the right place. So taking that analogy, you can maybe work it backwards, taking the, um, the conclusion there, what would the analogy be? So maybe in place of poor, you can put Seriphian. So the good man from Seriphus um, would not make a name for themself, right? But the, if this man who is not so good, right, the one who is um, abusing him, the, the Seriphian who was abusing him, if you were from Athens, you wouldn't make a name for yourself either. If you were a native of my country, if you were Athenian, you would not be famous. Just as if I were Seriphian, I would not be famous. So Seriphian is code for poor, Athenian mm, in is this. code for rich. Mm -hmm. Right. So because I'm such a good person if i was in your poor country i'd be a good poor man that wouldn't be great because you're a mm. bad dude um even if you're athenian that would make you rich because athenian means rich your mm -hmm. nature i'm saying you're bad so you're a bad rich man so neither of us would be famous or uh on the other side of the analogy neither of us mm. would have a comfortable life mm. right and then it may be a bit reaching, but it is possible also it's a dig at Socrates. Because after he gave his little speech about how he's a man of character and good temper, Socrates' reply is, nah, you're just rich. So if you plug these two men into the same analogy, Cephalus is saying, well, I'm a, a good rich man but if you even if you had wealth socrates you still wouldn't handle old age as well as i do right, but whether you see that or uh, whether you think it's a dig or not either way anyway he is certainly saying that yeah his money makes it more comfortable but also he's a man of good temper and character so then Socrates goes on and asks, May I ask, Cephalus, whether your fortune was for the most part inherited or was it acquired by you? Acquired, Socrates. Do you want to know how much I acquired? In the art of making money, I have been midway between my father and grandfather. For my grandfather, whose name I bear, doubled and trebled the value of his patrimony, that which he inherited being much what I possess now. But my father, Licinius, reduced the property below what it is at present, and I shall be satisfied if I leave to these my sons not less, but a little more than I received. Okay, so let's break that down, make sure we understand what he's saying, because now he's showing us Many generations, right? There's the grandfather, the father, and now him. At the end of this book, around books, books eight and nine, we're going to see a number of different constitutions. And in English, we can talk about a person's constitution, and you can talk about it in, in the sense of government constitution. There's sort of a play on words there. And there seems to be the same thing in Greek as well. And so Plato plays with that, talking about different constitutions and then the person who matches that. And we're going to see him going through somebody, like many generations. He's going to give a number of different constitutions in each generation dropping a little. And so you can actually match, once we get there, you can come back to this introduction and match those constitutions to the grandfather, the father, and Cephalus. 
And so what kind of person is the grandfather? Right now, we can't yet put the names of the constitutions as Plato uses them because we're still in the introduction. That's already and that's all the way down in book eight. But we can still get some idea of what kind of person is he? What do you see here about the grandfather, Jed? He was very good at making money. Mm. Doubled and tripled the value of his money. Mm. So very good, very focused on money making. Mm. Right, exactly. And I think trebled must be tripled. It must be like old English. Um, yeah, so he made a lot of money, really cared about money. How about the father? He was decadent. He spent it all. He spent mm. the money mm. and he didn't really care as much and he, he wasted it. Well, not mm. wasted it, but he, he, he used it he up. Probably wasted it. Probably yeah. Wasted it. yeah. <laughs> and then how about Cephalus? Well, if Cephalus is the next in that lineage, uh, that raises a question. Well, but just from what he says here, what would you say about him? Um, from what he says here, we've gone from money making, money spending to somewhere in between. He's saying so. He's he's doing that technique of um, um not answering anything directly, like uh, just a second ago he he um substituted. Um, the other guy who said, oh, you're just rich for Socrates, because Socrates just says that, and he uses that as like a metaphor to have a dig at Socrates. And um, all the way through, he's um, he's being very obtuse in how he's saying, he's not speaking directly. And if um, earlier we talked about how it's difficult for him to travel to Athens, if Athens mm. is representing a philosophy, it's it seems difficult for him to have a straight conversation and give a straight mm. answer. Because here he said another puzzle. He's saying he's somewhere between his grandfather and his father. So he's mm. he's raised it more than what he received, but he hasn't doubled it like his grandfather has. Mm. Good, right. Because the implication... When you hear this, is you imagine him right in the middle. But he doesn't actually say that. He just says that he, his father reduced the property, property excuse me, below what it is at present. We don't know how much the father spent. So it may have been, he may have been super rich. Maybe the grandfather was super rich. But the father was so wasteful that they were still well off, but much less than before. And so if it's higher now, it still may not be even half of what his grandfather had, had left the father. It Can't still may be not that much. This guy. Mm, right. And then he's going to leave it to his sons. So it's going to be split up. So they're not rich anymore. It's <laughs> the implication there. Well, yeah. I mean, if he's got more than mm. one son, then he would have had to mm. have doubled it in order to leave his sons as much as his father left him. Mm. So if he's got more than one son, he's actually done mm. worse than his father because right. he's leaving his sons with less because he said, I, mm -hmm. I didn't do as good as my grandfather who doubled it. He needed to have doubled mm. it. So he's actually worse, but he's saying it in this weird, uh, tricky way where he sort of changes things around and he's not direct. And, mm -hmm. But he right. wears a crown, which is interesting. Mm, that's right. He's wearing that garland. And that's going to come up again in the introduction here. Um, so just a little bit more to this introduction. And... And Socrates replies, that was why I asked you the question, because I see that you are indifferent about money. Is he indifferent? No. No, no. He, he already acknowledged before that he's, he's handling old age much better because he's rich. But Socrates tells him, well, I see you're indifferent about money, which is a characteristic rather of those who have inherited their fortunes than of those who have acquired them. The makers of fortunes have a second love of money as a creation of their own. So like the grandfather, right? 
resembling the affection of authors for their own poems or of parents for their children. Besides that natural love of it for the sake of use and profit, which is common to them and all men. And hence they are very bad company. For they talk about nothing but the praises of wealth. That is true. Yes, that is very true. But may I ask another question? What do you consider to be the greatest blessing which you have reaped? from your wealth. One of which I could not expect easily to convince others. For let me tell you, Socrates, that when a man thinks himself to be near death, fears and cares enter into his mind which he never had before. The tales of a world below and the punishment which is exacted there of deeds done here were once a laughing matter to him, but now he is tormented with the thought that they may be true, either from the weakness of age or because he is now drawing nearer to the other place. He has a clearer view of these things. Suspicions and alarms crowd thickly upon him, and he begins to reflect and consider what wrongs he has done to others. And when he finds that the sum of his transgressions is great, he will many a time, like a child, start up in his sleep for fear, and he is filled with dark forebodings. But to him who is conscious of no sin, sweet hope, as Pindar charmingly says, is the kind of nurse of his age. Hope, he says, cherishes the soul of him who lives in justice and holiness, and is the nurse of his age and the companion of his journey. Hope which is mightiest to sway the restless soul of man. How admirable are his words. And the great blessing of riches, I do not say to every man, but to a good man, is that he has had no occasion to deceive or to defraud others, either intentionally or unintentionally. And when he departs to the world below, he is not in any apprehension about offerings due to the gods or debts which he owes to men. Now to this peace of mind the possession of wealth greatly contributes, and therefore I say that setting one thing against another of the many advantages which wealth has to give, to a man of sense, this is, in my opinion, the greatest. Okay, so what did he just say? What for him is the greatest blessing of being rich? He hasn't had to scam anybody, like those people that need, need money. Hmm. And what does that do for him? So it's in this last paragraph here. Give some peace of mind. Mm -hmm. Right. But then what did he say up here? What did he say happens when a man thinks himself to be near death? So at the top of his statements there. Tormented with the thought mm. that, that mm. he might be judged for his actions. Mm. Right. Exactly. Does that square up? The good no. man has no has no concerns but he wakes up at night like a child he starts up in his sleep for fear and he's filled with foreboding what was he doing when the scene opened he had the exactly. garland on his head oh yeah what does that mean i don't know essentially like be begging for the gods you know uh trying to make penance with uh, the mm. gods. Mm. Right, he was doing some sort of sacrifice for the gods. 
So which camp is he in? Is he the kind that has all these fears or the kind that is enjoying the benefit of wealth by not having wronged anybody? Seems like he's suffering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's another so it seems like he's... Mm, go ahead, yeah. It seems like another one of those true but not true things that he's very clever of saying. One thing that's true, mm -hmm. but mm. then it's not true because it doesn't really apply to him. Like he's saying, mm. well, uh, <laughs> if you're rich, you don't have to scam someone in your life, so you'll be at ease and it makes mm -hmm. life more comfortable, um, mm -hmm. you know, and anyone who's worked for a boss <laughs> knows that you can't be honest to your boss all the time. Uh, when he's paying, you know, your, your wages and stuff. But if you were rich, if you're a Larry David sort of person <laughs> and you're rich, you could just say whatever you want and be honest with everyone to your hilarious demise in that Curb Your Enthusiasm show. But here he's saying, well, I wake up in a start and I'm worried. So perhaps he is saying that the way he acquired his wealth or the way he dealt with business, even though he was rich, was uh, in one of those ways where he didn't need to have been. Like he's saying, if you're mm -hmm. rich, you don't need to have been, you don't have to be duplicitous. Mm -hmm. But I wake up in a start, which implies mm -hmm. that he probably was duplicitous in mm. his use of wealth or the way he gained wealth, even though he was rich. Exactly. Right. And you can also look at the other side of that. He says that the implication here is that if you're poor, then you have occasion to deceive and defraud others. Do you think a truly good person would think that way? Would you? It's okay sir? to be deceptive if you're poor? Would you steal a if loaf of bread to feed your starving family? Well, not just that, but deceive and defraud. That's more than... I think we can have some sympathy or, you know, for the starving person who steals bread. But um, when you think of people who are deceptive, who are liars and defrauders and deceiving... Do you think that the poor person who is, we would say good, we're just keeping it very simple here, the good person, the just person, would be deceptive and defrauding people because they're right. poor? Yeah, I, I took both mm. extremes. I took mm. the, the poor, because mm. there are a lot of people in our capitalist society who have, are in poverty systemically and they don't have much recourse. So steal some bread to feed mm. your family is one extreme. And Larry mm. David, who's one of the richest men alive, who's just honest about everything, to everyone is the other extreme, but you're right. Um, mm. uh, more fair way of doing it is in the mm. middle where if you're not facing those extremes, would you go around defrauding people? Mm. I, I guess that is the question. Um, it, yeah, I in, in all fairness to Larry David, I don't know that he's the extreme. Maybe something like the CEO who wants to pay their employees starving wages. Oh, right. So that would be the extreme mm. of um, mm. uh, injustice mm. when using yeah. it. But I was talking about uh, his point here that if you're rich, um, you don't oh, have to sorry. lie. To, you don't have to lie to people. You don't have to, um, you know, trick okay. people. Like you can just tell the truth. Mm. And um, mm. and I know that there is an element of truth in that. Like, mm -hmm. if you are rich, you can, and that's Larry Dave. What if you were rich enough mm. to just be honest with everyone all the time? That's the curb your enthusiasm TV show. Mm. But we're not in those extreme. We're not really referring yeah. to those extremes here. Yeah. You would have to go to like also the state of mind of what you're expressing and maybe what you truly feel, but is it necessarily just or compassionate or wise? That's a different issue. So we'll, we'll leave that for now. But yeah, what he's saying here that um, the good man has no occasion to deceive or to defraud others. If he has money. But the implication is that if he's poor, well, you know, you have an excuse. So again, not expressing um, the most solid virtues here. 
And so Socrates replies, Well said, Cephalus. But as concerning justice, what is it? So there's Socrates going into his usual questioning, right? What is justice? To speak the truth and to pay your debts? No more than this? So just speak in your mind, is that? Or speak the truth, what you think is the truth anyway. Um, and to pay your debts, is that, is that enough? And even to this, are there not exceptions? Suppose that a friend, when in his right mind, has deposited arms with me and asks for them when he is not in his right mind. Ought I to give them back to him? No one would say that I ought or that I should be right in doing so, any more than they would say that I ought always to speak the truth to one who is in his condition. You are quite right. But then, speaking the truth and paying your debts is not a correct definition of justice. Quite correct, Socrates. If Simonides is to be believed... Oh, oh sorry, that was, that was Polemarchus. Polemar uh, mm. Okay, so Polemarchus jumps in. Um, yeah, quite correct, Socrates, if Simonides is to be believed. I fear that I must go now, for I have to look after the sacrifices, and I hand over the argument to Polemarchus and the company. Is not Polemarchus your heir? To be sure. And he went away. And he went away laughing to the sacrifices. All right, let's stop there for a moment here. So, why was he laughing? Maybe because he got out of talking about defining justice. <laughs> mm. Did he stick around long for that conversation? No, 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 no. <laughs> he would ra probably rather think that justice was just those things that mm. he had defined it as, because that's much easier to mm. obtain with that limited definition. Right, yeah. Does he come across as a uh, just man? Particularly. Mm. Yeah, but on the surface, it all sounded very nice. Would you agree? Yeah. Right. Yeah, he was talking in a way that you often hear people talk about justice and about old age. But as soon as the conversation turned to Socrates' usual sorts of discussions here, as concerning justice, what is it? Let me highlight that one. So this is where the conversation turns, okay? And this is where it's going to continue then as we read on next week. Now it's getting into that. But everything up to that, it was just sort of small talk, right? Here, this Cephalus is very comfortable with. As soon as it turns to a real discussion, remember what he said earlier. Why don't you come here more often and talk to these young men? He doesn't want those conversations. What does he want to do? Remember, he was at the sacrifices at the opening. He had the garland on his head like he had been doing sacrifices before Socrates arrived. And now what's he doing? Handing off the argument to uh... mm -hmm. mm. right and going back to the sacrifices. This highlight is a little. I was trying to highlight the words; it's not working well. Um, but yeah, he's back to the sacrifices. What does that tell us, Jed? Was your impression of of Cephalus? Well, he said that as much as the pleasures reduce the pull on the reins mm. he sees he enjoys the pleasure and the charm of conversation and here he mm. is running out the door just when the conversation's starting mm -hmm. mm. so all the things that he's describing don't really apply to him mm -hmm. uh he's not a good rich man he's not someone who enjoys the pleasure mm -hmm. of conversation well or maybe it's true to the extent of the pleasures for a moment, like maybe he just mm -hmm. finished a big meal or a, or something, 
that satisfied his urges and for that mm. brief period he was able to engage in a conversation but it's not the way that the poet he's quoting is describing mm -hmm. where he was free of a master mm -hmm. so the description what well, well, might be true doesn't apply to him mm -hmm. uh so he so he isn't free of whatever that master is. He, the pleasures are back and forth very quickly because he's taking, uh, he's following that that line. He doesn't really care about his kids, uh, and that he's not sticking around to learn about justice in a way that could help his kids. He's sort of passing them off to a babysitter. So he's more interested in whether he gets into heaven and if he can buy his way in than he is his mm -hmm. own kids. And he also, right. that was the point he made with his uh, finances. I'm leaving my mm -hmm. kids with less than what I got. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps even around half of what I got. Um, yes. And he hasn't, uh, he hasn't learned anything and he's laughing, which is one of those rhetorical devices of just mocking the interlocutor. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And he's used many. He's used um, uh, misquoting a, a poet, um, uh, using a stand-in metaphor mm -hmm. um, by saying, oh, this guy insulted me and called me rich, but I said to him that you wouldn't be a good man here. He's talking to Socrates, so that's another rhetorical, mm -hmm. uh, like a straw man argument, I think we call that. Mm -hmm. uh, and here, this is the, the appeal to mockery um, by laughing mm -hmm. at him. So he's using rhetoric um, and he hasn't been made better, and he isn't going to make his mm. children better. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if he's laughing at Socrates. I didn't get that sense, but he's laughing because he knows he's escaping, and he's getting out of it. I wonder and if he gets also, pleasure in that laughter. Mm, yeah, dumping it all on his kid, and he knows his kid's not going to get all that much money. It's his heir in that sense, too, right? But he gets a good laugh, and yeah. it's pleasurable mm. to laugh, and it can be difficult to face these mm -hmm. tough questions Socrates is mm. throwing at him. It takes the right, pleasurable exactly. way out again. Right. Yeah, the easy way out is making more sacrifices, as if Zeus needs another goat. But there he is. That's what he's spending his money on. So uh, his kid's not getting – maybe his son is the heir – to his fortune, but there isn't going to be much left because he's spending it all on sacrifices because he's filled with fears and cares as he's reaching old age, reaching the end of his life. Right. And I like that um, Socrates' question when it did become important mm. went mm. straight to the mark. It's funny that we brought up Larry David, someone who is – his character mm -hmm. is the personification of rich and telling the truth all the time and the mm -hmm. hilarious consequences that follow. And Socrates' question was, well, what if you are rich enough to pay your debts and you're honest to everyone? By the way, is it good to be honest to everyone all the time? Which was the point that you're making, which is the next mm -hmm. uh, logical step in that following of reason. So we're now mm -hmm. entering a philosophical conversation mm -hmm. and the first question Socrates asked Brings down the Larry David idea of virtue. <laughs> oh, that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. So um, from next week, then we'll pick up this philosophical discussion and see where it goes. So Polamarchus did inherit the conversation from there. And then he's the one who is going to have a, some discussion then next with Socrates. And so we may use the same translation, or I'll check out the one that um, Jed was telling me about in Perseus. I've seen some, I've gone to Perseus before, and I've seen like just short paragraphs, but if we can see the whole text and just go through the whole text, that would be great. So um, I'll check that out. So that's a possibility, and if it is, then I'll leave the link in the description box then, instead of the, a link to a PDF, it'll be a link to that site. Okay, so any final words, by the way, before we sign off? We're good? Okay, so still very early, so there's not a whole lot going on yet. We're still just kind of figuring out what all the pieces are. But uh, those of you watching on YouTube, I hope that you enjoyed that, and I hope that you'll join us next week as we get further into this discussion on what is justice. So thank you very much, and hope to see you next time.